1979 had many landmark events that would shape and reshape the world with ramifications that continue into the present. The Three Mile Island incident gave the United States its first taste of what a nuclear disaster can be, though not as much as the entire world would see in the next decade. Sony released the Walkman for $200, allowing people everywhere to carry their music around without bothering other people. Michael Jackson released his first solo album. Dictators Idi Amin of Uganda and Pol Pot of Cambodia were removed from power, their regimes having cost the lives of over 2 million people. Iran became an Islamic Republic, leading to Sharia law being imposed and the Tehran hostage crisis. Saddam Hussein came to power. Star Trek returns with the motion picture. Superman comes to big screen, the Muppets get their first movie, Russia invades Afghanistan. The world's first anthrax incident breaks out in Ekaterinburg, Russia. China institutes its one child per family rule to control population. Romania's first metro line goes into use in Bucharest. An anti clan rally in the US ends with a gunfight, and Pink Floyd releases the famous album The Wall. All that within one year, and I'm skipping over a lot of things. Somewhere around there, there were games and technology as well. Motorola released the 68000 CPU, one of the last great processors before everyone switched to either x86 or PowerPC for consumer-oriented products, and then of course ARM. But it would be some time before it would go into widespread use. The new generation of personal computers like the Atari 400, the more expensive Atari 800, the Texas Instruments Ti 994A, and the NEC PC8000 series would still be using CPUs built on technology developed in the previous years that was starting to show its full potential or something close to it. In the wake of the massive success that was Space Invaders, everyone was trying to get into the act. Namco released Galaxian, which was a lot like the game it was inspired by, but with a lot more color to it and letting the enemies actually swoop down individually onto the player's ship. The game was successful enough to start its own series and help Namco establish a presence in the industry for a long time. Nintendo came in with its own attempt at making a Space Invaders game named Radar Scope. It had its own twists and improvements on the idea, but didn't really take off in the markets they were hoping for. So the game is mostly remembered for the large amounts of unsold arcade cabinets that were modified to create Donkey Kong. Thankfully, not everyone in the arcade scene was trying to copy Space Invaders, and we got a few games that offered some variety. Lunar Lander finally fulfilled the promise of the old text game from 1969, that of letting the player land the craft on the moon, but this time with actual direct control over the thrust and not just inputting numbers and waiting to see the results. The arcades also got one of the first sword fighting games ever made, in the form of Warrior by Tim Skelly, a game where players were able to control both the movement of their character with a joystick as well as the movement of their weapon with a second joystick, a great concept that most action games these days still haven't caught on to, leaving the second joystick as a camera control. Warrior also was one of the earliest uses of actual real-life motion as a basis for creating the anime in a video game. And since vector graphics were the new craze, we can't forget Asteroids, another legendary video game from that age that rivaled Space Invaders and allowed players to drift around space blasting asteroids and not having to worry that 35 years later someone would turn this concept into an open world survival game with crafting and never actually finish it. Home console games were getting more interesting, with titles like Adventure, not to be confused with Colossal Cave Adventure, this was the Atari 2600 game designed by Warren Robinett. In it, you would visually explore two castles as a simple square, because that's what your character was, it couldn't really do all that complex graphics, with the goal of recovering an enchanted chalice by battling dragons and generally trying to not get lost. Adventure is also noted as being the first game to feature an easter egg in the form of a room where the name of the author was hidden. And since people now had computers in their homes, it didn't take long for games to show up in a big way. FS1 Flight Simulator was created by Bruce Hartwick and Steve Moment when they were students at the University of Illinois. They formed a company called Sublogic and brought the game to the market 
for the Apple II and the TSR-80. It can be said that this was the first video game flight sim you could buy for a home computer. It ran about as well as you can imagine a game trying to display a 3D environment would run on such old systems. But for the time, for what it was, this flight simulator was an amazing feat, the beginning of a new type of game, a new type of experience where you wouldn't be playing for a score, you wouldn't be playing to explore, you wouldn't be playing to defeat something, you were there to fly a plane and enjoy the experience of it, which ran at less frames a second than you would consider today as being playable. But if you did enjoy exploring, fighting and looting, well 1979 was a great year for never leaving your room provided you had a computer in it. Jim Connolly and John Freeman had founded Automated Simulations the previous year, and along with Jeff Johnson they created Temple of Upshy for the TSR-80 and Commodore PET. This was a game where you could explore over 200 rooms that had individual descriptions in the manual, fighting 30 different types of monsters, all with the goal of doing just that until you got bored. Temple of Upshy was the first game of its kind for the home computer to have a commercial release, and sadly, one that has drifted into obscurity as time went on. It has spawned an entire series named Dungeon Quest, with around 12 games, all of them being based more or less on the same D&D inspired rule system, and now they're all nearly forgotten. The opposite was true for the other RPG dungeon crawler to show up on the home computer in 1979. A high school student named Richard really liked making games, even in an age where they were essentially stored in punch cards. When he got access to an Apple II and the basic programming language, he made a lot of them, and the 28th version of his creation seemed to be good enough to actually sell to other people, so he did, by hand. The game he made was dubbed Akalabet The World of Doom, Richard Garriott's first commercial video game and the genesis of the entire Ultima series. The game was picked up by the California Pacific Computer Company for publishing, netting Garriott around $150,000 over the course of the game's initial run on the market. That can be seen as a lot of money now, it was a heck of a lot of money back then. Akalabet was the blueprint upon which the entire Ultima series would be built upon, and many other games to follow in the next few years, though with a lot fewer references to Tolkien's work. Akalabet was more focused than Temple of Apshai. You had an actual objective, you had a quest to do, and you had an overworld to explore as well as dungeons to go down into and probably die of starvation or poison, usually both. Considering my love for the Ultima series, Akalabet would be the surefire bet for the game of 1979, but I've got to give that title to FS1 Flight Simulator. It spawned the series that is now known as Microsoft Flight Simulator. It spearheaded a new genre of PC games and brought the concept of the simulation as an experience unto itself into the limelight. Not in the way that simulators are known for today, where they simulate nothing and are just jokes, but ones that actually went into detail, they tried to impart onto the player new information, new ideas and the dream of one day being able to explore an entire virtual world. That is why Flight Simulator, a serious game if you will, is important. It started a trend of integrating realism into video games that has influenced pretty much every other game genre. And yeah, sure, that version was primitive, it was nothing compared to what we have now, but back then when the most popular video game had just two colors and it was just a flat image, giving them this. That just blew minds. And with that, the 70s come to a close. Next week we're moving up to the 80s. Goodbye.